Jack was swimming deep underwater, wondering why he had such a pounding headache when suddenly he had a terrifying realization. He had no idea where he was or what he was doing. There was a nagging feeling that he must have a specific reason to be here. You don't just end up deep in the ocean with a diving suit on by chance. Yet he had no idea what he was supposed to be doing. He wasn't sure he cared either. He was more worried about the throbbing pain in his head and the vision of two eyes staring at him out of the dark that he couldn't get out of his mind. His heart began to race as he wondered what to do and how to get help. He was in the middle of the ocean and appeared to be all alone. He couldn't see anything in the dark water except for this weird gray substance in front of him. Maybe he was going to die here alone. Without knowing if anyone could even hear him, he began to speak aloud about how he was consumed by sickness and that darkness was all around him. This is the story of one of the most powerful and dangerous anomalies yet discovered, SCP-3000. Before Jack's descent into despair, the SCP Foundation had mandated an exploratory expedition off the coast of Bangladesh. After receiving a few strange reports from locals and fishermen, the Foundation suspected an SCP was lurking in the water and positioned a few personnel to investigate. The crew expected danger, or maybe even death. But what they got instead was far stranger and more ominous. All of the men had been verified to be in sound mental states when the mission set out, but a few of them reported feeling strange and uneasy as the submarine descended into the ocean. Before long, a veteran agent named Dr. Williams began to panic in a way that was completely out of character. He started sweating profusely, shaking, and wouldn't listen to a word of comfort or reason that anybody tried to offer. It might seem like a relatively normal reaction for anyone descending into the depths of the ocean to meet with a monster that they don't know anything about, but Dr. Williams was a seasoned professional who had been on hundreds of such missions before. There was no logical reason for him to act like this. Although the reaction of Dr. Williams was the most extreme, he wasn't the only one who started to feel strange. Multiple agents developed a creeping feeling of unease that swept over over them. One of the calmer men tried to reason with Dr. Williams, asking him what was wrong and if he could explain exactly how he was feeling. That's when things got even stranger. Not only was the doctor extremely anxious, but he now seemed incapable of giving a real response to any questions thrown at him. He could only mutter that he was missing something, but he wasn't sure what. Knowing that many SCPs can bend reality and the human mind, many of the personnel began to have second thoughts about the mission and even asked for permission to call off the mission. But they were mandated to continue, so they went on. As the team went deeper and deeper into the ocean, things only got worse. Even the previously calm crew members became spooked and antsy, while the ones who were already anxious were now sweating and jittering. As for Dr. Williams, he was now pacing back and forth around the submarine, saying things nobody could understand. Every time he looked at his colleagues and his close friends, he seemed to stare straight through them and would call them by the wrong names. It was as if his mind had moved to a different dimension. Whenever someone asked him to perform his normal duties, he looked more confused than ever. Still, the team went deeper. Dr. Williams began to whimper and say the word no repeatedly, growing louder and louder until he was screaming and the others were forced to sedate him. Just then, something came into view. It was what would come to be known as SCP-3000. The thing was huge, so huge that its whole body couldn't be seen out of the submarine window. It was a horrible, eel-looking creature with a head as big as a town and haunting eyes that lit up the black ocean around it. But perhaps the strangest part was this giant eel seemed to be producing a weird gray liquid. Even the sedative wasn't enough to keep Dr. Williams calm anymore. There was a strange blank look in his eyes as if the light and life had left him, and he just began screaming no repeatedly again and wouldn't respond to any attempts to calm him down. Not that anyone else was very capable of calming him down at this point. Even the crew members that had been holding up well were starting to act strangely, and nobody could get the image of these ominous eyes out of their heads. Then things went from bad to worse. Williams began screaming and shouting madly as if he was being tortured by an unseen force. The men tried to restrain him, but it was no use. He began smashing his head against the submarine window until it cracked, putting the whole mission and everyone's life at risk. He fell to the ground injured, chanting that there was nothing, whatever that meant. It was an emergency scenario. They began applying first aid to Williams as the submarine ascended to the surface as quickly as possible before the pressure of the ocean caused the cracked window to explode. By the time they reached the surface, Williams was dead. But there was something even more chilling than the circumstances of his death. Every single man who had been in that submarine experienced the same thing on the days that came afterward. The image of the eel-like creature's eyes seemed burned in their minds permanently. 
It would haunt their waking hours for the rest of their lives, and sleep was no escape either, as they would appear in both their dreams and nightmares alike forever. A second mission had to be sent to gather more information about the strange beast. Already, there were many theories and question marks surrounding SCP-3000. How big was it really? Was it sentient? What was the liquid for? None of the men who had been on the previous mission were willing to return to the waters, but a new group of brave recruits volunteered. They were about to find out what so many in history have learned the hard way, that bravery and foolishness are often mistaken for the same thing. This time, the mission would not be in a submarine but in dive suits, in order to observe the anomaly in even closer detail and to eliminate the chance of one team member self-sabotaging the submarine killing them all. They were transported to the location by boat and the three men splashed into the ocean. They descended, and at first everything was going well. In case anything went wrong, the three of them were tethered together for extra security. But the deeper into the ocean they swam and the closer they got to SCP-3000's location they got, the stranger things became, just like on the last mission. First, there were a few minor cases of confusion. One of the team, Jack, thought it was his responsibility to lead the navigation, but another, Roberto, also thought it was his job. In fact, navigation was actually the job of a third team member, Amir, but he seemed to have forgotten. Everyone was getting confused. The team listening in on the conversations at the Foundation headquarters grew increasingly concerned about what they could hear. Was everyone losing their minds? Hopefully, nobody was about to pull another Dr. Williams on them. Still, the project leads couldn't afford to tell the men to come back to the surface. The Foundation badly needed any information they could get on this SCP, whatever the cost, so they told the men to press on. Things only got worse. Roberto was asking to speak to a colleague who passed away two years ago, while the others began to mutter indistinguishable phrases about eyes and darkness, not too dissimilar to the ramblings of Dr. Williams. It increasingly began to look like a suicide mission. Then there was silence. What was going on? Each of the men had completely lost it, to the point that they cut the tether that was holding them together. All alone, Jack couldn't remember where he was or why he was here. He desperately looked around to try and gauge his surroundings, but he could only see darkness. All he could think about was a pair of large eyes and an overwhelming fear of despair and anxiety and this weird gray fluid that was now floating in front of him. The Foundation listened as Jack started reciting a creepy speech about being on the edge of nothing, inches from oblivion, with a sickness in his mind and nothing but a pair of eyes in front of him. They listened in horror as they heard movement through the radio. It sounded like a huge creature was swimming toward the men. It had to be SCP-3000. But all three men were too confused to do anything about the situation or to even see what was in front of them, claiming they couldn't see anything in the darkness. There was silence for half a minute with the team listening in, fearing the worst. Then they heard some more unintelligible mutterings. The men must be alive, but what on earth was going on? Then the gibberish started again. Two of the men were screaming that Jack had just been swallowed whole and that they were being sucked in too. Why couldn't they just swim away? It was chaos. But then a few moments later, Roberto spoke into the radio, saying he was floating alone in the middle of the ocean and had now moved away from the eyes of SCP-3000. He finally seemed capable of forming coherent thoughts and speech. After what had just happened, Roberto now had a theory. He thought that somehow it was impossible to think straight around SCP-3000. When he'd been close enough to see the eyes, Roberto had felt a throbbing pain in his brain and been unable to think about anything. Perhaps it was something to do with that mysterious gray liquid. Even more slime was coming out of SCP-3000 now, and Roberto was determined to get a sample despite the warnings from HQ. In one final burst of motivation, he swam close enough to take some of the gray liquid and put it in a special sample collection unit that was designed to float to the surface for collection later. He had acquired some very important data, but he seemed to have lost all hope of preserving his life. Roberto started telling the team over the radio that he was dying and that his heart rate was too high, but cautioned that it would be too dangerous for anyone to try and rescue him. The personnel continued to try and communicate with Roberto to figure out what was going on, but his words had stopped making any sense until finally he went quiet. Minutes turned into hours, hours into days, and still there was no sign of Roberto or the rest of the divers. After three days, his radio, which had only been sending a steady stream of static, finally stopped working altogether and he was presumed dead. However, the sample Roberto had collected had survived and made it to the hands of the Foundation researchers. It turned out to be a viscous substance now known as Y909, 
a chemical compound and extremely strong anesthesia. Y909 causes head pain, paranoia, fear, panic, memory loss, and confusion, explaining what happened to Dr. Williams and the diving trio. The collection of Y909 might have resulted in two disastrous missions, but there's a silver lining as the substance ended up becoming an invaluable tool for the SCP Foundation. Its ability to make people forget what had just happened to them can be used to eliminate knowledge of threatening SCPs among the public. It also helps the Foundation staff cope with the traumatic experiences they encounter on their missions. Although other amnestics can be used for the same purpose, none are as powerful as the one produced by SCP-3000. Before its discovery, the amnestics used would break down too quickly, not fare well in storage, or cause undesirable side effects. The only problem is the method of sourcing. The only way to obtain Y909 is somewhat ethically questionable for most people. SCP-3000 produces Y909 after eating, so the best way to stock up on it is by feeding the creature. Sedated D-Class personnel from the Foundation are sent on missions supposedly to observe the anomaly up close, unaware that this mission is one way only. Other divers are then sent later to collect the fluid from a safe distance and store it. Of course, it's all for the greater good of humanity. Now, the Foundation protects SCP-3000 as best as it can guard something hundreds of kilometers long. The area is carefully patrolled, and members of the public are not allowed to enter the part of the bay where it resides. Anybody who accidentally comes into contact is contained. Eventually, another pair of Foundation doctors went down in a submarine to try and learn more about SCP-3000. One became so affected by Y909 that he began hallucinating. He started talking about Ananta Shesha, the king of serpents in Hinduism. Ananta Shesha is believed to be all that will be left after the end of the world because it exists throughout all of time simultaneously. The doctor said he believed that this was in fact Ananta Shesha, that SCP-3000 simply shows us that eventually everyone dies and fades into the darkness of oblivion, right before he exited the submarine and swam right into his mouth. Luckily for now, SCP-3000 seems to be in a sort of hibernation state. It rarely moves and it doesn't hunt, although it will eat when fed. But no one knows when or if it'll wake, or what it's capable of if it does. Will it destroy the world, or simply drive us all insane?